Good morning. You listen to the Blaine's World show heard here each Wednesday on the new WPVM LP in Asheville, North Carolina. You can also listen online at WPVMFM.org and watch on WPVM's Facebook page. I'm your host, Blaine Greenfield, and each week we focus on the theater scene as well as the music scene, along with positive news and information about people and organizations in the Asheville area and elsewhere. And toward that end, it's my pleasure to introduce my first guest, a friend of mine, Elson Torres. Welcome aboard, Elson. Hey, Blaine, how are you? Good to be here. Okay, well, well, I wish we were together. You're, you're in- Good to be here with you together. You're, <laughs> you're in Miami and, and I'm here in Asheville. We're, we're still stuck inside um, because of this, this virus thing. Um, but I should also mention, Elson, we're on Facebook Live. So if you wanna to wave to all your fans and friends in Facebook world, we're live. How are you, my buddies, my friends? Okay, great. And um, I should mention that it's a real treat to have Elson as my guest. So I've known Elson, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so. What, about, was that, what, what, how long? Probably like around eight, eight, eight years, when you were, seven, seven, eight years, yeah. And the story I, I tell that um, I was invited to a concert. Uh, friends of mine gave me tickets that I want to see Sly in the Family Stone. I said, sure, you know, why not see Sly in the Family Stone? I had this guy playing, a guy by the name, Elson Torres, and I remember Cynthia and I said the show that no offense to Sly in the Family Stone, we liked you better, <laughs> you know, so. It's a, it's a big compliment. <laughs> well, no, but it was just, you know, I, I thought you sold the show, and it's no surprise because uh, Elson is then a Grammy Award nominee for Best Song of the Year. Um, he also is, um, as he describes himself, a cross between a Cuban-born, New York City-raised singer-songwriter residing in Miami's um, in, starting in Miami area. And if you cross the two, you'd mostly be getting, I love how you describe this, sonic kaleidoscope of Elston. Elston is two-time Grammy nominated, multiple BMI award-winning singer songwriter. And you'll hear as we do the interview, but Elston provides a sprinkle of British signature pop with a dash of Cuban troubadour roots and a chunk of Americana heartland soul. He offers a distinctive breast of fresh musical layout developed through years of writing and performing all over the world. Elson's music brings along with it a new world order of alternative pop. I like how you describe that, alternative pop. With as many years of successfully composing top 10 hat, hits for internationally known artists, including number one song on the Billboard charts, he balances the likes of um, commercial pop with the authenticity of independent music. And let me ask you, Elston, um, I always ask that when I meet a performer for the first time or interview them, how did you get into the um, business of becoming a singer songwriter? Well, my story starts back in New York City. Um, as you said in my bio, I was born in Cuba, but I left Cuba at a very young age with my mom and my older brother who was five at the time. I was a year and a half old at the time. And we, uh, we migrated to New York City where my uncle was, my mom's brother. Um, Growing up in New York City, I was surrounded by some family members who had also escaped from, from Cuba, uh, including one of my other uncles who was a singer-songwriter in Cuba. So, you know, in between uh, family gatherings and family get-togethers, he'd always have his guitar. He'd sing his songs about Cuba, and songs about love and his lost love and people he left behind. So growing up, I was very in tune to, to, to the guitar and to hearing him write and sing original songs. So I just naturally kind of gravitated to that. And um, as the years went along, then I started discovering other music that I became enamored with, you know. Uh, I, was, I was always a child of, I always loved really old music first, uh, like the blues and 50s rockabilly, and then the Beatles after that. And then of course the contemporary stuff which was around the 80s. You know, I got into U2 and the Police and Elvis Costello and all these other bands. But I was always surrounded by, by, by music and by originality in music, you know? You remember the first time you ever played before an audience? Um, I remember that I used to, <laughs> I used to force myself to, uh, to play at, uh, at my cousin's birthdays, birthday parties in New York City. Just a small group, you know, family members and some friends and neighbors. But I was a really shy kid, so I was always, I wanted to, at a very early age, I wanted to combat the shyness with music. So I would kind of force myself to, to, to ask my cousin to let me sing a couple songs. Uh, what, what, <laughs> really big, 
would really be cool. Um, we should do this sometime. You don't have a video of that somewhere, do you? I don't know if we have any videos, but I know she's got some pictures. <laughs> okay. Wouldn't that be cool? You know, you just have a, a performance. I always thought it'd be a great, great thing to do with Elson, uh, do a fundraiser, and everybody would be there to play their first performance. You know, you could play when you were 11 years old or seven years old or, you know, yeah. have, have that. Uh, do you remember your first gig? Yeah, your first paid gig. Do you remember it? The first paid gig was, uh, I was in high school. I was probably a freshman in high school, but I was already, uh, I was already part of a band, uh, like a, a rock and roll band. And we do, um, we do, um, you know, covers of other people's songs. But um, I wasn't the singer, I was the guitar player. Cause I was, like I said before, I was very shy. So I didn't want to get in front of the, uh, an audience and sing. So we got hired to do this high school dance party. And um, it was it was a fun it was a fun show. We didn't get paid much. I think it was like 10, 15 bucks each. And after that first show, the lead singer of the band quit the band for some reason. I don't remember right now. And since I I used to do background vocals for the band, uh, the bass player who was the oldest of the band and the, the so-called leader of the band, he basically knighted me, the lead singer of the band. And I was like, I can't do that. I'm very shy. And I, <laughs> I don't think I have the ability to do that he said ah, you'll be fine so he basically threw me into the fire pit and, <laughs> and uh as soon after that I, I started singing i started uh performing as a, as a lead singer and i can see in the in the background you know with the poster there yeah i see a frame there is that your first check you ever got it you framed it and and, and put it <laughs> back here is my that that's my one of my grammy nominations and that's one of my bmi awards no, okay, so you didn't say that first check though. I, you know, I didn't. I should have. <laughs> yeah, or framed it, whatever. Maybe should have so, framed it. So you were a kid then. So you were in a band, and they. How old were you? You were in high school, sixteen, seventeen. I was probably about four. No, about fourteen, fifteen. Younger. And did you just, yeah. then just continue from there? Yeah. Then around that time, I, I kind of uh, caught the bug of writing. Um, one day, walking into well, one of my English classes. Um, I found a piece of paper on the floor that uh, was crumbled up and I picked it up and uh, I read I read it and it's, it looked like it was a song but it was a some it was probably some guy writing a, a love letter to a girl that he liked and I liked it I said oh this sounds really uh, really cool and I took it home and I wrote my first song with it you know um, I co-wrote my first song because I didn't officially write the lyrics to it <laughs> I kind of uh, do you remember the song I remember the, the the song's title was called Girl is the World is Changing Fast. I don't remember it all, but <laughs> Girl, the world is changing fast. It's getting harder and harder to live love will last. Something like that. <laughs> I love it though. You know, you, you, I don't think I ever heard that or you never recorded that, did you? No, I never I never recorded it. No, you know, I uh and subsequently I wrote that song. And then I had a, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, uh, who I knew who was older than I was, and he was already writing songs. So I wanted to get his opinion since, you know, he had more experience than I did. And I, you know, I went by his, he was, he lived like two blocks away from me in New York City. And went over to his house and I played him the song. And he said, you know what, that's really good. That's, that's not bad. And he gave me some pointers on how to fix it a little bit. And I went home and I fixed it a little bit. And then we kind of just, bounced off songs back and forth and we wound up being in a band together me and him later on. So now you then, that sort of your songwriting career, what's cool about you, you've continued since then and, and Bob, yeah. how many songs do you think you've written? Uh, I mean, at this point, definitely over 300. Over yeah. 300 songs. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's probably a lot more, but that I officially can say. Do you prefer, what do you, perform prefer then songwriting or performing you know for me and i know there's people that do one or the other and there's people that do both i'm one of those that do both and i enjoy both i mean i still enjoy performing live because it's an immediate reaction which is not the same thing with songwriting you know you write a song you you may know that it's a good song but until other people hear it and you know confirm that for you you don't really know not that you need confirmation to you know to feel good about a song but uh but yeah i mean you obviously you write you create art so that other people can also listen to it and hear it and, and see it and experience it you know 
Well, sometimes though, I guess when you write a song, do you just have a gut feeling that that's, that's a winner? You know, do you just kind of know that? Yeah, there's some songs that, <clears throat> especially once you do it for a long time, and for me, it just became a muscle that I trained, that I worked on, where now that I, <clears throat> every time I sit down to write a song, I know that I'll write a song. <clears throat> Whether it's going to be great, that's a different story. But, you know, uh, not, every, not every great songwriter or a good songwriter writes a great song all the time. All the masters will tell you that, you know, Paul Simon, McCartney, they'll tell you that they've written bad songs. It's just, you know, I always say every song leads you to the next song, you know. So for me, every song for me is a, is a learning curve as well. You know, you learn from every song. But I, I mean, I know when I write a good song, I know that's a good song, especially there are songs that kind of write themselves in a way. Um, they just kind of like flow out of you. And um, after you finish them, you're kind of like, all right, where did that come from? You know, it's just kind of like a divine intervention of sorts. You know? Well, the, um, in terms of the uh, songs you've written, uh, we'll talk about some on your current, we don't call it an album anymore. We call it, it, it you don't project, you know, a project. Some people call it a record, you know, we used to call it records back then too. But they used to have something called records, you know, and, and albums. And I mean, I still call them albums because to me, it's an album. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm a kid from the you know seventies and eighties where we used to go and buy the album. No, but you can't show it to me. You don't have the the album because it was. I don't have. But you have yeah, a cover know. on it, though, right? You still put a cover on the project. Yeah, you still. I mean, you still create the art for it. You know, um, you still need to because you know when you when you post stuff on um, on, me, on media and social media. You need to have the artwork so that people can find it when they're looking for it, you know? And, and one of the things you, you also do, and I think you do it very well, you not only have to be able to post on social media, but a lot of your songs now you, you do videos of, you know, and, and, and your videos yeah. are really, really cool. Is Thank that you. something you enjoy doing too? Yes, video, uh, videos became part of what we do, basically from uh, starting from, you know, the 80s, from MTV uh, days. They kind of became, you know, in sync where now if you release a song and it doesn't have a visual to it, it kind of gets lost because people, I think YouTube is still the number one place where people listen to music, which is crazy if you think about it, because it's not really a music channel, it's a video channel, or it's a video network or, or you know, whatever it, it is. Um, so I think, yeah, I think for most, for most albums, for most songs, for most singles, you need to have a visual attached to it, you know, which is great. But what's unfortunate about that too is sometimes the visual kind of like cements the songs that the song idea, where you can't think of a song without thinking of the video. <laughs> sometimes it happens, and I've heard people tell me that. Like some people have told me, you know, you know, I love this song, but uh, that, that really is kind of strange. And or is it I, the, the other way around? You know, or yeah. <laughs> they like the video and they, the song is like, I don't know about the song. But um, I always tell them, you know what? I, I respect whatever director I work with. And I usually work with relatively talented directors. And I let them, I give them free range on what they want to do creatively. Because as, as a creative person myself, I, I don't appreciate when somebody tells me, you know, well, that, you shouldn't do it that way. I, you know, I give them the song. I, if I have an idea for a video, I'll tell them, well, I had this idea for, for the video. And we usually come come uh, in the middle of, of the idea, and they'll they'll use some of the ideas that I have, or they'll come up with something totally different. Now, on your new project, are most of the songs have you written? I know, except for the last one, maybe. Have you written all all the other songs yourself? Um, not all. No, some of them are co-written with some great writers, great friends that um, uh, talented people that I've worked with. You know, but you I, I, I like. I like I like to collaborate. Yeah, it's it's great. You know, that's it's a fun part of writing. Because I'll ask you about I don't know if it's the first one, but maybe it's the first one I heard. And it was around for a while, but then you did the release on with the project, which was fantastic. I'll be gone. You know, right? Because you were in, written that a while ago. Is that correct? That one was a couple of years ago. That was that was a song I wrote right after my divorce. Yeah. And um, that's this is one of those songs that kind of came came out all at once. It was kind of like. It was just waiting for me to pick it up and and, and release it. <laughs> well, I love it. And yet, you, you, then you, I saw the video on it, which you know I, I love also. But we won't get to see the video now. But could you do the song for us? 
Yes, please. Uh, this one's called I'll Be Gone, and this is from the album At the End of Love. You're going to love me again when I'm gone. You're going to love me again when I'm gone. You're going to wake up on a rainy day and wonder why you went this way. You're going to love me again when I'm gone. You're going to see the light of your mistake. You're going to see the light of your mistake. You're going to find out a bit too late that you messed around and you grew a fate. You're going to see the light of your mistake. Because when I'm gone, you're going to love me again. When I'm gone, you're going to love When I'm gone, I'll be gone, and you won't be able to repeat my name, cause I'll be gone, da 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 You're gonna love me again when I'm gone. You're gonna love me again when I'm gone. You're gonna wake up on New Year's Day, look around and see what you've made. You're gonna love me again when I'm gone. Cause when I'm gone, when I'm gone. When I'm gone, I'll be gone, and you won't be able to repeat my name, cause I'll be gone, I'll be gone, I'll be gone, I'll be gone, I'll be gone. I love that. The um, thank, you. thank you. What's great about it, Elston, and a lot of your songs, but especially that one, I think anybody can relate to it who's ever been in a situation where you leave a relationship or had a relationship. I mean, that really has universal and appeal. Um, and, that's, and that's a great compliment to hear from someone because I think the intention of, I don't know if it's a, a conscious intention, but when you write a song, you want it to connect to other people because we, you know, we're humans. We all experience the same uh, range of emotions, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's love or breaking up with someone or, you know, sadness, happiness euphoria uh it's a human experience we all live through it how do you get your ideas for songs um everyday life you know i i, I think that life especially in what we're living now this new reality um life is full of of inspiration you know uh, um it, it just you know if you open your eyes and you open your ears all you have to do is stick your head outside <laughs> And and you know, I look at the world. Just look, look at look in the mirror, and, and and look inside yourself and see what you're feeling. But my songs come from um, from the human experience. You know, whether it's my own or whether it's somebody that I know or something that I've read, a movie that I've seen. Uh, some I don't watch the news much, but you know, some news story or something like that. I, I try to connect. I try to connect it as much as I can to the human experience because I think. I think that's what it is, and all, and all my favorite songwriters, I think, um, I know, work that way too, you know? And that's why they, they become who they've become, because we can all relate to their songs. You know, someone like Paul Simon writes for everyone, you know? I think he knows, he, in, his, in his way of writing lyrics and, and marrying the lyrics to the music, we all can relate to it, you know? Do you write every day? 
You're right. Uh, I, ha I have been since <laughs> since the coronavirus started. <laughs> So it's in there. So one positive thing, we might get some new music out of it. Which, well, what happens with the day and day of, of life and, you know, we all have to go out and make, earn a living. And I'm one of the lucky ones that I, I work doing music 100%. But even as a musician and as a songwriter, I have to go out there and hustle and, and do different types of projects, you know, um, not, which, is not, which not only consists of songwriting and, and performing, you know, I also mentor. I also uh, am creative director of certain projects, and and which is stuff that I love to do anyway, because it's it's also using my talents to to benefit other people. I, I love <clears throat> I love using what I what I've learned in my life and what I've honed in my life to to help inspire other uh, people, whether they're younger or older or whatever. You know? What impressed me, uh, Elson, about you um, is the fact that yeah, we're going through some tough times. But you're still getting out there, you know, and, and, and recognizing, I guess, that you can't do stuff the way you used to. So right. the other day, for example, I saw you online, I think it was, and you were doing, I don't know what you call a mini concert or something, but it's for the Grammy organization. I was just yeah. impressed. Talk about what that, what, what that was all about. So we, um, my album, At the End of Love, was coming out uh, either way. It was going to come out April 10th. Um, we had already programmed it, you know, when you you're about to release a, a project, a, a music project. It's months before, sometimes a year before, it actually comes out. And we already had released two videos, singles, for the album as a, as a precursor to the album coming out April 10th. So we were gonna perform a live show in Miami for our, our friends and fans here in Miami. Um, but obviously, we couldn't. Um, so, in, in talking to Doug Emery, who is the co-producer of the album um, and played a, a lot of, uh, he produced the music part of the album and um, he plays a lot on the album. He's an amazing musician. Um, we talked about doing something live, uh, on, live on, on social media. And Doug Emery is the president of the Florida chapter of the, of the Grammys, of NARAS. So there's a, there's a branch of the Grammys called Music Cares which is a great organization who really helps musicians and families of musicians and friends of musicians who find themselves in a hard place, uh, in a difficult time. Uh, and they're helping a lot uh, now with what's going on. The musicians who basically have, have lost their way of earning money. Um, there's a lot of musicians who don't write songs, who make their living by playing outside, you know, uh, playing at clubs, playing at weddings, playing at events. And I do some of that myself, you know. Um, but Music Cares is a great organization because they do come through for a lot of people. And during Katrina, they helped a lot of the uh, New Orleans uh, musicians as well, as many other uh, you know, um, uh, tragic events that happen. They're always there to help uh, musicians and their families. So I, I thought what better organization than to raise money for, than for one that has helped me in the past and has helped so many people that I know, uh, the Music Cares. And we were able to raise a good amount of money for them. We had fun in doing it. It was great watching it. It was like a mini concert, you know, just between, between you and, and uh, Doug, is it? Uh, it was just Doug, yeah, Doug Emery. Show. By the way, is that still available? People want to see it? Can they still see yeah, it? Yeah, I believe they still, they still can see it. And I downloaded it. A friend of mine downloaded it. Um, and I'm going to post it up on YouTube, and I'm going to share that. So it's okay. always going to be up there. Yes, Luke, because I haven't had the time to do it. But I mean, I mean, Marby, you, you were talking about some of the songs in that, that sing at that, that show. It was so much fun to watch because I hadn't seen, you know, anybody performing kind of live. And it's really right. did a great job on that. And, and uh, thank, thank you for sharing that. And uh, we'll talk that that one, you, you went through a whole bunch of the songs, I guess. That was kind of your, your pre, that was your release party for the, the right. album. It was a release show for the, uh, for the project. For the a virtual project. release. So had you planned a show? Were you going to, if it would, Yes, yeah, we were gonna, we were gonna perform in, in Miami on April 10th, the same day that we did the Facebook Live. Okay. We were going to perform here in town at a, at a place called Bar Nancy. And unfortunately, we had, to, uh, we had to postpone the date. We set a new date for July, but we don't know if that's, you know, who knows? And then, like <laughs> I said, who knows? And my concern, Elson, for you and musicians and, and other performers, even if we can get around, are people going to come out? You know, or are they going to... Which is, a, which is a big issue, and I understand why people wouldn't want to come out. I mean, if you would, tell, if you would ask me to go out to a show now, I probably wouldn't go. 
you know? Right. Except it's, it's, too, bad it's we're not, too bad we're not in Georgia, though. We could get a tattoo, you know? Um, exactly. <laughs> you can pro wrestling, but, you know, you, you can't do other things uh, there as well. So let's talk, all the songs on it I, I love, but let's talk about one in particular um, has just really resonates with me, and that's Borders, you know? Yes. And um, talk about the idea behind Borders of, of the song. Borders? Borders is a song that I co-wrote with Adam Zimmerman uh, and Aaron Fishbein, uh, two amazing musicians. Uh, both have amazing careers, and, you know, you just look them up, and they've done wonderful things in their careers. And uh, we sat down... A, f a few times write songs and we wrote some really great songs together and uh, Borders happened to be one of them. And Borders, what I love about Borders is that it's very, it's a very sparse song. Lyrically, it's not, it's not a, um, it, it doesn't have a, a lot of lyrics to it, but I think the lyrics that we came up with are, are, are deep enough or, I you know, I don't want to sound too, <laughs> uh, they're profound enough that I hope people can interpret it their own, their own way, you know? Uh, we, we try to make it simple language so that people can relate to it. Uh, but the message, you know, the message is different for who, from whoever interprets it, you know, the way that they would. I always think that's the beautiful thing about the song is that, you know, wherever you are at the time of your life is how you will interpret a song, you know? Um, and I feel that Borders is that way. And, I, and I've gotten so many compliments about this song. and. So many people have told me, well, this song is about that, and this song is about that. And I'm not going to tell them they're wrong. Yeah, you're right. That's the way you hear it. It's, it's like art. When you see a piece of art on, on the wall. Well, same thing, too. I remember when I saw the name of the song, I was so impressed that you were writing a, a song about a bookstore, you know, and, and right. um, <laughs> yes. whoa, we're, we're thunk, you know. But when I heard right. it, wasn't, it wasn't quite about a bookstore. Why don't, you, right. why don't you share, if you would, please? Sure. This one's called Borders. Borders, all the ones we've made. She doesn't think the horizon tomorrow. I am ignores the past. I for her won't last till she knows. Till she knows where she wants to go. A moment longer than it seems. Memories linger to their Where she wants to go home, where she wants to go, fences all along the way. I couldn't say here tomorrow 
it's gonna change very nice thank you what playing um writing a song you have a preference with that with respect to you writing it yourself or how is the experience writing it with other people is that challenging it's um you know i've i've I gotta say, knock on wood, and I have wood right here. <laughs> I've had a good experience with um, with writing with other people. I my my professional career when I started writing um, professionally, what I call professional, uh, was back in 1995. So we're talking 25 years ago. Um, I was I got signed to to Warner Chapel Publishing, which is one of the major publishers of the world. Uh, and back then we were. Um, we were headed by uh, a woman named Ellen Muraski. May she rest in peace. She was an amazing woman of the music industry, and she she um, she gathered a lot of really talented young up and coming songwriters from from the area. She was originally she was born in Cuba like I was, but she lived in L.A. and London and Nashville, so she had a good sense of what a good song was, and she was the first one to tell me. Austin, I want you to write with this person. And at first I was insulted because I was like, but Ellen, you signed me because you like my songs. Why would you want me to write with somebody else? And she was like, no, I'm not going to The point is not, she was very straightforward. The point is not that I don't like your songs. Obviously, duh, I love your songs. That's why you're here. But you're going to discover when you write with somebody else, they're going to bring something out of, out of you that you've never even realized that you have inside of you. And she was 100% right. And ever since then, I've, I've enjoyed the, the process of, of, of connecting and writing with, with somebody. And many times, you know, they turn out to be lifelong friends afterwards. I mean, after a while, you, you wind up writing with the same kind of people, especially when you realize you have a chemistry with them and you write good songs together. So, you know, a la Lennon and McCartney. <laughs> uh, you know, when you, when you, be, when you write with somebody uh, and you have a special chemistry with them, you tend to to go back there and write together, you know. But I still, I still enjoy writing by myself as well, you know. I was going to ask you. So, do you still do some songs just by yourself? Yes, I do it a lot actually. But same I'm currently writing. In terms of performing, do you prefer performing by yourself or do you prefer performing with others? Well, that's a very good question. I, I, um, there's no, there's no feeling. There's no feeling, first of all, being on stage and performing, whether it's by yourself or with, a, or with a band. But I do love playing with other musicians on stage just because it's a certain energy and brotherhood and sisterhood, depending on who's on stage with you, um, that only happens on stage. And it's, it's, almost like, it's almost like making love without making love. It's you, 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 become, you become in sync with, 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 that, with those people on stage with you. And it's it's uh it's it's like a sexual healing, like you feel and it, and if everything is in sync, the audience is in tune with you, the band is in tune with 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 everybody on stage, the sound is right. It's, to me it's 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 celestial, it's, it's spiritual, it's it's you know, it's I mean, it's happened to me where I've been to, you know, concerts where I walk out there and I I walk out of the concert, and I'm like, I just I just experienced God, you know, that that to me was God, you know, or whatever you want to call it, you know. Um, and, 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 I, and I think that's what music does. So I, you know, the short answer is I do enjoy playing with other musicians on stage, but I also do enjoy playing on, on my own with, with uh, you know, just me and my guitar. One of the things I also admire about you, Austin, is the fact that you constantly seem to be going in, in different directions, you know. And for example, I've also gotten a kick out of seeing you doing sort of what I'm doing now, but you also, I really enjoy you do these podcasts, right? Where you'll interview other people in the industry. Yes, yes. I um, uh, the show is called and it goes like this, and um, I'm, my my uh, partners in crime in that show are uh, Danny Barrocas, who is the director of I'll Be Gone, the video I'll Be Gone, and uh, me and him have been friends for many years. He was one of my key people in my in my career when I first started out here in Miami. He was part of the label that I was signed to. And uh, sitting around one day, we were like, you know, I'm, I'm a people person. I, <laughs> I, like, uh, I like talking to people, especially creative people. And, um, and we just came up with this concept to do the show. And, um, and I enjoy it. I really do enjoy it. And it's, it's fun. It's, 
I get to meet, I get to wear a different, a different hat. I get to, uh, I get to express another side of myself that I don't usually get to do with music. Um, and I'm hoping that after all this is done, that we can get back into production and, and you know, and really getting into it and, uh, and doing more of it, you know? You've done a bunch of them, I've seen. You'll, you'll post them too. How many of you? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we've done a bunch of them and we still have a few that we haven't uh, finished editing there that are about to come out. Okay, and then you and I have talked off the air. I know another thing, I don't know if it's an ambition of yours, but I get a kick out of watching your videos because you're usually in the videos. So it's yeah. this other side of you, that this uh, acting side of you. Have you ever given any thought to acting? You know what? I'm a big fan of movies and, and acting, and I've always have been as a, as a kid. And and actually, the cinema inspires me a lot to write. And, and my songs, a lot of my songs are are come like I said before. They, the my songs are inspired a lot by by everyday life and also by movies that I that I've watched uh, or scenes that I've seen in movies. So I I do enjoy the the acting part. You know, I um, I, I think a couple years back I took an improv class for like three or three or four months, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, my respect to actors, it's, you know, it's not, it's not an easy task. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a challenging, uh, job in many aspects. Uh, but if, again, like, like music, if you get it right and it's the right role and the right actor, there's nothing like that. Right. I mean, you know, who doesn't love a great movie with a great actor or a great series? Now we're all into, you know, Netflix and watching series. I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, of a lot of series on Netflix, so. Because I could see you doing some acting or, you know, that be in your next life, you know. Okay, yeah, my, my next life. Or maybe this one. <laughs> Who knows? Let me ask you another question, Elston. And, and one of the things, I, again, I, I love about music, I love when you sing in English, but also, I don't speak Spanish, but I love it when you s sing in Spanish. Yeah. A question I keep asking, you know, do you have preference? If you had a choice, do you have a feeling one way or the other about English or Spanish? I mean, I, I, I love doing both, honestly. I mean, English, English is my first language. Spanish is my first language because I, right. my mom only speaks Spanish and I grew up with my mom and my grandmother speaking to me in Spanish as a little bit, as a little boy. But by the time I started going to school, everything in New York City, everything was in English, obviously. So my English became my dominant language. But Spanish has always been a part of my life. And I love the fact, one of the things that I do appreciate about Miami is that when I moved here over 25 years ago, my Spanish was not very good. I spoke Spanish and I understood it very well. But living in New York and, you know, you mix the Spanish with the English and sometimes you invent words that don't exist. <clears throat> and when I moved here, just because of the fact there's so much, the, the, Latin, the Latin community is so strong and the Spanish culture, the culture of the Latin culture is here so strong that you, you don't have a choice than to speak Spanish. <laughs> so what I did, I, uh, I just honed my Spanish. I started reading a lot in Spanish. And honestly, my career opened up to the Spanish uh, music industry. That's where my career really started taking off. I started writing songs in Spanish and that's, you know, my, my successes have, have been in the, Latin, the music industry in Spanish. So I enjoy doing both. I mean, Spanish to me is a little bit more challenging just because I'm not as fluent um, as I would like to be, I, as I am in English, but I'm fluent enough that I, you know, that I, that I obviously can write songs. You know? Because in the current project, it's almost mostly it's in English, I believe, but English. Do you sometimes in, in so many projects, you'll sometimes mix it or a concert? I, I believe you'll, you'll mix. Oh, I always mix. I always mix it in my concerts. I always like throwing in a couple of Spanish songs or depending on the audience. If I know my audience is going to be mostly Spanish, I'll sing mostly Spanish and throw a couple of English or vice versa, you know? And I'm actually working on the follow-up to this next album is going to be an all-Spanish album, um, which some of the songs I'm writing now will hopefully be songs that will be released on that album. You say, no, same thing too. When we saw you, uh, obviously we love the English songs, but Cynthia never heard, you know, you sing in Spanish and she just loved it. You know, so uh, for some reason, I don't know, she just... It's a different sensation, a different feeling, especially if you don't speak the language, you know, like. I know this is weird to say, but I, I think I'm, in, I'm a different, and I've heard this from other people, I'm a different writer and I'm a different artist in Spanish than I am in English. Like I, my approach to writing in Spanish is different for some reason. Like I, I still have the Beatles influence and the Simon influence, but it's, there's, there's also, 
like Cuban roots really show up a lot in, in the Spanish writing, you know, which is great, which I love, you know. You ever sing in other languages? I sang one time, I did sing one of my songs um, in Portuguese, which I, I love Brazilian music. I'm a big fan and I understand a lot of it. But one thing is understanding it and hearing it, and another thing is actually <laughs> trying to trying to sing it. It's it's it was it was a challenge, but it was fun. The same thing too. Uh, I speak very little French, but I love French music. You know, just to listen yeah. to it, uh, even though I don't speak it. And since I, I brought the subject, I won't ask you to sing a lot of songs in Spanish. But could you do one one Spanish song for me? Yeah, I'd love to. I um, as a matter of fact, I'll sing you the song that that I sang in Portuguese as well. The song is called La Vida Cambia. And uh, there's a wonderful video for it as well. I, I invite everyone to go check it out. La Vida Cambia, it means life changes. Uh, and the song is very, um, it's very apropos for what's going on in the world. It talks about how life can change in a split second and how we have to basically enjoy each moment because we don't know what tomorrow brings. Um, and on, on the video and on the song, um, I have a, a wonderful Spanish um, artist very well known, Antonio Carmona, who sings on it with me. So I invite everyone to check it out. It's called La Vida Cambia. A veces hay alegrías y sin sabores. Cada momento es único, no hay algo más. I have to tell you, um, Elston, that people watching on Facebook are kind of lucky in that my wife is not here with me, uh, in that I want to start dancing to that, you know? <laughs> Let me ask you that. When people, when you're performing, what's your feeling about people either dancing or singing along? Do you oh, like it's that? It's the greatest feeling in the world. It's the but greatest even, feeling in the world. Even singing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think that's, that's what you want people to do. You want them to have a good time. They, you want them to, to, to feel feel alive and feel inspired you know well i guess that's the advantage where you have the mic though you know so um the advantage yes <laughs> <laughs> no so, I, yeah so, so someone singing out of key i don't have to listen to it <laughs> i'm telling you the story uh, we'll talk about 
uh, our favorite, you know, one of my favorites, Leonard Cohen. I told the story, I went to a concert with my brother and it wasn't Leonard Cohen singing, but it was singing Leonard Cohen songs. He started blasting them out, you know, and, and his wife kept poking him, you know, you want to hear the performers, you didn't want to hear my brother, you know, so um, people, I guess, can get carried away, but just whenever I listen, I have to, I didn't tell you this before, but I have to turn off my mic because I want to sing along, you know, and, and uh, I, I don't think they want to hear me, they want to hear you, you know, but well, that doesn't bother you? It doesn't bother me at all, no. It, doesn't bother, it makes me happy, actually. When they get up and dance and have a good time? They get up and dance, yeah, it's, it's I mean, you know, to me, it's it's the biggest compliment. I, I mean, it, it, it 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 shows us the performers that we're we're uh, we're touching people that people are inspired to to get up and dance you know and feel good. One of the things I love about your music and I've always loved about it is I can understand every word you know and I think that's really cool you know that like sometimes I'll watch I'm not as obviously the music buff you are but I'll watch the Grammys I'll watch other music shows and you know half time. I just do it so I know the names, but I have no idea what they're singing. Right. <laughs> the beauty of, of what you sing, every word I hear, and that's kind of cool, I think. You know? Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, it's funny, growing up, uh, and maybe because I was a bilingual kid, kid and I didn't understand English at that early age, but I was a big Elvis Presley fan growing up. For some reason, I don't know how a Cuban kid growing up <laughs> in Washington Heights, New York, falls in love with Elvis Presley's music, but... but uh, I couldn't understand a lot of the words he was singing. And I, maybe it was because I didn't understand English that well by then. So I used to make up words. Maybe that was my beginning of songwriting. So I used to, you know, come up with, you know, you ain't nothing but a whatever. <laughs> and, like, and then years later, I, I, I listened back to those songs. And I was like, oh, that's what he was saying, you know? So, and I, you know, and I, I think that's great. But I, I know what you mean. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of singers who interpret it, you know, they're singers they're personality singers and sometimes you don't you know like Mick Jagger Mick Jagger is an amazing uh performer and um uh, he's not an amazing singer but he's a he's a very it's I love his voice because it's so um uh, it's so Mick Jagger I mean, there's nobody can sing with Mick Jagger you know but sometimes he's hard to understand you know well there's an article I'll send you about the fact that even watching movies on Netflix people now are starting to watch the subtitles as they watch the movie. Yeah. It's a big trend because you'll be watching a movie and you know, if it's in your native language, you miss half the things or you miss a joke or they turn sideways. So right. people get to hear the, have, have you been, I don't do it, but I know a lot of people are starting to do that. You know, you know I, I always have the subtitles on just because if I miss, if I miss a line or if I miss it, or if they're whispering sometimes, right. you can't, well, exactly. You well, can't really hear them. So I like having the subtitles on. I don't read the subtitles all the time, right. but, but if, I miss, if I miss something, I, I catch the, the, oh, that's what he said, okay. Well, it's yeah. funny, you were ahead of the game, you know, because becoming is a very popular thing now on, on, on Netflix. In the remaining time, unfortunately, I only have time maybe for two more songs. I'll, I'll choose the last one, you know, it's going to be the Leonard Cohen song, but right. out of the um, current album, I'm looking at them, I love all of them. You want to choose one, one that you could sing? That sure. I mean, I could do, uh, I could do girl, I could do half hearted, I could do comeback. Where are you? What are you? Have a girl. All right, let's do girl. So girl's another song I wrote with um, Adam Zimmerman and uh, Aaron Fishbein. And go something like this. This one's very uh, Beatle influenced and kind of like Paul Simon influenced, I guess. Surrounding with trees, summer brown, summer red, summer red change. The two day girl is the moon that you meet in a little world of fairy tale possibilities. All it never did to you, to build to colors I see. Wondering who's on the walls of 
Very nice. You mentioned Paul Simon. Who are your other influences on your music? Uh, my other influences as well, Leonard Cohen, obviously, um, as, a, as a songwriter. Elvis Presley, uh, Johnny Cash, the Beatles, without doubt. The Beatles were probably my biggest influence uh, as a songwriter. Uh, love Bob Marley. Um, I love um, Luis, uh, Juan Luis Guerra, who's a... Uh, a very, very talented, legendary uh, songwriter from the uh, Dominican Republic. Um, Caetano Veloso, who's a Brazilian songwriter. Um, Bob Dylan, there's so many. I mean, there's so many people that have influenced me uh, throughout the years. Elvis Costello, who I luckily got to work with uh, uh, last year. With um, He's one of my biggest influences as well. It must have been exciting to work with him. Yeah, I mean, um, I met Elvis a few years back um, through a mutual friend, uh, Sebastian Chris, who actually wound up producing him. Sebastian's one of my dearest friends. And they just actually won the Grammy for best traditional uh, Latin, um, I'm sorry, best traditional pop uh, album. Uh, it's the recent Grammy, and my friend Sebastian produced it. So a couple of years back, I met Elvis. Um, I was invited to one of his concerts, and I went backstage, and to me was like, for me personally, was meeting one of my, one of my icons, one of the people that taught me how to write songs. And subsequently we kind of have a friendship where we send each other emails and, and it's, it's, it's really wonderful because it's, it's great to meet somebody that you've admired all your life and, and see that they're a person, that they're actually a, a good hearted person and, uh, and, and has earned everything because they've worked hard at it. And I got to work with, with uh, not, not with him directly, but with his songs. Um, there, we, we did a, a bunch of his classic songs in Spanish, and I was in charge of translating uh, a bunch of them from, uh, from English to Spanish, which was, uh, which was challenging and thrilling. <laughs> if folks want to find out more about uh, Elson Torres, the best, best way to get information. My official website is elston.info. Uh, you spell elston, E-L-S-T-E-N, dot info. You go to that site and you'll find uh, pretty much everything you need to know about me, you know, uh, except for my pant size. <laughs> the last, but, uh, yeah. no, I'm sorry. The last thing I'll, I'll ask you as we're winding down, if I can just have you do the, um, I guess, the song behind the um, project, the name of the project, and uh, if you just want to talk a little bit about that song. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was, when I was finishing the album, um, the, the company called me, Warner, Warner Chapel called me, my publishing company, and said, so what do you want to call the album? I mean, the typical thing is to, to choose one of the songs and use that as the title. But I, you know, given that these songs were very, um, 
very sentimental and very heartland songs. I think they're they're very you can you can almost feel these songs when you listen to them. At least that's what I what I hope. Uh, Lenny Cohen to me was is one of those writers that lyrically he 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 wrote in a way that you you felt and you visualize everything he was saying. And one of my favorite songs of his is "Dance Me to the End of Love." And I thought, what a better title than "At the End of Love," because a lot of a lot of the songs have to deal with with that reality now that we all have to deal with. Okay. So this is called "At the End of Love." I might have to cut in at the at the end of the song, but grab it. Okay. <laughs> On that, Elson and Wong have to say thank you for our fabulous show. The, uh, you, the fabulous Elson Torres um, was guest on the Blaine Show, show heard here on WPBM FM. And we hope to see you next week, same time, same place. Thanks, buddy. Stay on. I'm going to go off the air and then I'll just say goodbye to you in a second. So oh, thanks for listening, great. folks. And I want to conclude with some uh, discussion with Elson. See you next week. <laughs>